Hi everyone, it's Miss Brenner. We're going to continue on with our story As Good As New by Charlie Jane Anders. We're going to start at the top of page six. The theater has been an endangered species for a long time, Marisol said, not without sympathy. She looked around the pasty white, yeast-scented deathscape, a world of wonder bread. I mean, I get why people want criticism that is essentially cheerleading, if, even if that doesn't push anybody to do their best work. Well, if you think of theater as some sort of delicate flower that needs to be kept protected in some sort of hothouse. And at this point, Wolf was clearly repressing arguments he'd had over and over again when he was alive. Then you're going to end up with something that only the faithful few will appreciate. And you'll end up worsening the very marginalization that you're seeking to prevent. Marisol was being very careful to avoid asking anything resembling a question because she was probably going to need all three of her wishes. I would guess that the work of a theater critic is misunderstood in sort of the opposite way that the job of a genie, she said. Everybody is afraid a theater critic will be too brutally honest, but a genie. Everybody thinks I'm out to swindle them, Richard Wolfe threw his hands in the air, thinking of all the twists he had endured. When in fact it's always the client who can't express a wish in the clear and straightforward terms. They always leave out crucial information. I do my best. It's like stage directions without any stage left or stage right. I interpret as best as I can. Of course you do, Marisol said. This was all starting to creep her out, and her gratitude at having another person to talk to, who wasn't Mrs. Garrett, was getting driven out of her, uh, out by her discomfort at standing in the bleached white ruins of the world berserking about theater criticism. She picked up the bottle from which, from where it lay and undamaged after hitting the rock, and found the cork. Wait a minute, Richard Wolfe said. You don't want to... He was sucked back into the bottle before she finished putting the cork back in. She reopened the bottle once she was back inside the panic room, with the door sealed from the inside, so nothing or nobody could get in. She watched three episodes of The Facts of Life, trying to get her equilibrium back, before she microwaved some sukiyaki and let Richard Wolf out again. She started the, spot, the spiel about how he had to give her three wishes over again, then stopped and looked around. Huh? He sat and sort of floated an inch above the sofa. Nice digs. Real calfskin on this sofa? Is this the like? Is this like a bunker? I can't answer any of your questions, Marisol said, or that counts as a wish you owe me. Don't be like that, Richard Wolfe ruffled his two-tone lapels. I'm just trying not to create any loopholes, because once there are loopholes, it brings everybody grief in the end. Trust me, you wouldn't want the rules to be messy here. He rifles through the media collection until he found a copy of Cat, of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof which he made a big show of studying until Marisol finally loaded it for him. This is better than I remembered, Richard Wolfe said an hour later. Good to know, Marisol said. I never got around to watching that one. I met Tennessee Williams, you know, Richard said. He wasn't nearly as drunk as you might have thought. So here's what I figure. You do your level best to implement the wishes that people give you to the letter, Marisol said. So if someone says that they want to make sure that a nuclear war never happens again... You do your best to make a nuclear war impossible, and then maybe that change, change leads to some other catastro catastrophe, and then the next person tries to make some wish that prevents the thing from happening again, and on and on, until this. This is actually the longest conversation I've had since I became a wish facilitator. Richard crossed his legs, ankle over thigh. Usually it's just whoop, bop, aloo, three wishes, and I'm back in the bottle. So tell me about your prize-winning play, if you want. I mean, it's up to you. Marisol told Richard about her play, which seemed like something an acquaintance of hers had written many lifetimes ago. It was a one-act, she said, about a man who is trying to break up with his girlfriend, but every time he's about to dump her, she does something to remind him why she used to love him, or he used to love her. So he hires a male prostitute to seduce her, instead so she'll cheat on him, and he can have a reason to break up with her. Richard was giving her a blank expression, as though he couldn't trust himself to show a reaction. It's a comedy, Marisol exclaimed. Ugh, sorry, Richard said. It sounds awful. He hires a male prostitute to sleep with his girlfriend? 
It sounds... Ugh, I just... I don't know what to say. Well, you were a theater critic in the 1950s, right? So, I guess it was a different era. I don't think that's the problem, Richard said. It just sounds sort of misanthropic, or, or actually woman-hating, with a slight veneer of irony. I don't know. Maybe that's the sort of thing everybody's into these days, or was into before the world ended it yet again. This is something like the fifth or sixth time the world has ended. I'm losing count, to be quite honest. Marisol was put out with this fossil, was casting aspirations on her play. Her contest-winning play, in fact. But the longer she kept him talking, the more clues he dropped without costing her any wishes, so she bit her lip. So, there were half a dozen apocalypses, Marisol said and I guess each of them was caused by people trying to prevent the last one from happening again, by making wishes so that the white stuff out there, some kind of bioengineered corrosive fungus, I thought, but maybe it was created to prevent some kind of climate-related disaster. Does seem awfully reflective of sunlight. Oh, yes. It reflects sunlight just wonderfully, Richard said. The temperature of the planet is going to be dropping a, little, a lot in the next decade. No danger of global warming now. Ha! Marisol said, and you claim you're just doing the most straightforward job possible. You're addicted to irony. You sat through too many bridge plays, even though you claim to hate him. You probably loved Beckett as well. All right-thinking people love Beckett, said Richard. So you had some small success as a playwright, and yet you're studying to be a doctor. Or you were, before this unfortunate business. Why not stick with the theater? Is that a question? Marisol said. Richard started to backpedal. But then she answered him anyway. I wanted to help people, really help people. Live theater reaches fewer and fewer people all the time, especially brand new plays by brand new playwrights. It's getting to be like poetry. Nobody reads poetry anymore. And meanwhile, poor people are dying of preventable cancers every day, back home in tow. I couldn't fool myself that writing a play that 20 people saw would do as much good as screening 100 people for cervical cancer. Richard paused and looked her over. You're a good person, he said. I almost never get picked up by anybody who's actually not a terrible human being. It's all relative. My protagonist who hires a male pr prostitute to seduce his girlfriend considers himself a good person, too. Does it work? The male prostitute thing. Does she sleep with him? Are you asking me a question? Wolf shrugged and rolled his eyes in that opera operative way he did, which he'd probably practiced in the mirror. I will owe you an extra wish. Sure. Why not? Does it work with the gigolo? Marisol had to search her memory for a second. She had written that play in such a different frame of mind. No. The boyfriend keeps feeding the male prostitute lines to seduce the girlfriend via a Bluetooth earpiece. It's meant to be a postmodern Saro de Bergeric. And she figures it out and starts using the male prostitute to screw with her boyfriend. In the end, the boyfriend and the male prostitute get together because the boyfriend and the male prostitute have seduced each other while flirting with the girlfriend. Richard cringed on top of the sofa with his face in his insubstainable hands. That's terrible, he said. I can't believe I gave you an extra wish just to find that out. Wow. Thanks. I can see why people hated you when you were a theater critic. Sorry, I mean, maybe it was better on the stage. I bet you had a flair for dialogue. It just sounds so... Uh, I mean, postmodern, crano de Bergeric. I, I heard all about postmodernism from this one graduate student who opened my bottle in the early 1990s. And it sounded dreadful. If I wasn't already sort of dead, I would be slitting my wrists. You really did make a wise choice becoming a doctor. Screw you, Marisol decided to raise the relatively tiny liquor cabinet in the panic room and poured herself a generous vodka. You're the one who's been living in a bottle, so all this is your fault, she waved her hand, indicating the devastation outside the panic room. You caused it all, with some excessively ironic wish-granting. That's a very skewed construction of events. If the white sludge was caused by a wish that somebody made, and I'm not saying it was, then it's not my fault. It's the fault of the wisher. Okay, Marisol said. 
Richard drew to attention, thinking she was finally ready to make her first wish. Instead, she said, I need to think, and put the cork back in the bottle. Marisol watched a season and a half of I Dream of Jeannie, which did not help at all. She ate some delicious beef stroganoff and drank some vodka. She slept and watched TV and slept and drank coffee and ate an omelet. She had no uh, circadian rhythm to speak of anymore. She had four wishes, and the overwhelming likelihood was that she would fall, foul them up, and maybe next time there wouldn't be one person left alive to find the bottle and fix her mistake. This is pretty much exactly like trying to cure a patient. Marisol realized she gave someone a, med a medicine which fixes their disease but causes deadly side effects or reduces the patient's resistance to other infections. You didn't just want to get rid of one pathogen. You wanted to help the patient reach homostasis again, except that the world was an in infinitively more complex system than a single human being. And then again, making a big wish was like writing a play and the entire human race as players. Blech. She could wish that the bioengineered fungus had never dissolved the world, but then she would be facing, faced with whatever climate disaster the fungus had prevented. She could make a blanket wish that the world would be safe from global disasters for the next thousand years, and maybe unleash a millennium of stagnation. Or worse, depending on the slippery definition of safe. She guessed that wishing for a thousand wishes wouldn't work, in fact. That kind of shenanigans might be how Richard Wolfe wound up where he was now. The media server in the panic room had a bazillion movies and TV episodes about the monkey's paw, the wishing ring, the magic fountain, the Faustation bargain, the genie, the vengeance demon, and so on. So she had plenty of time to soak up the accumulative wisdom of the human race on the topic of making wishes which amounted to a pile of cliches. Maybe she would have done more good as a playwright than as a doctor, after all. Cliches were the plague in the artist artistries of the imagination. They clogged the sense of what was possible. Maybe if enough people had worked to demolish cliches, the world wouldn't have ended. Alrighty, guys. And that is the end of As Good As New up to page uh, 10. We are at the top of page 11, and we will pick up in part I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.